Russell Campbell Chair for Innovation in Science Education at the University of California, Riverside. In 2011, uh, she was elected Home Secretary of the United States National Academy of Science, uh, the first ever woman to hold this position in its 150 year history. Uh, she is a plant molecular geneticist known for her contributions to the field of plant uh, transpose on biology and plant genome evolution. Uh, she is from New York. She received a PhD in biochemistry from Cornell in 1980. And she was a postdoc fellow at the Carnegie Institute of Washington uh, from 1982 to 80, 1982. She began her career at the University of Georgia in 1983 where she remained until moving to UC Riverside uh, in 2010. Uh, Professor Wesler has contributed extensively uh, to educational and diversity initiative. As a Harvard Hughes Medical Institute professor uh, in 2006, she adapted her research program for the classroom by developing the dynamic genome course uh, where incoming freshmen uh, can experience the excitement of scientific discovery. The dynamic genome course is currently taken by over 500 students uh, every year. As uh, NAS Home Secretary, she has spearheaded initiatives um, that have led to a 40% increase in the number of women elected to membership in NAS. Uh, she is recipient of several award, uh, awards, uh, including the Stephen Hales Prize in 2011, from the American Society of Plant Biologists, the Excellence in Science Award from FASEP in 2012, and the McClintock Prize for Plant Genetics and Genome Studies in 2015. She is member of National Academy of Sciences since 1998, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 2007, and the American Philosophical Society in 2013, and a foreign member of Royal Society uh, UK in 2017. Professor Wesler, it's a real pleasure for all of us, and it's an honor uh, to have you with us today. So over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm trying to think. Let me make sure this works. And then I don't, would you be able to monitor hands raised? Because I'd be willing to stop and answer questions if people wanted to, if something was confusing or something like that while I'm talking. So if if you want, if you do the hand raise or whatever you want to do, you know, if it doesn't get out of hand, we could try that. No so, problem. I'll monitor that. Me and Abdullah can. Okay, do great. That. And feel free to interrupt me. That's fine. So let's see if I can get the share screen here. Let's get my uh, seminar here. Uh, hang on. Let me do this right. It's always the hard part. Okay, let's see what we got here. PowerPoint, all right. Okay, hold on. Do you see that? Hello? No, not yet. <laughs> okay, you should be seeing it. Um, I'm not sure why. I tabbed, did let me do this. I did the share screen. Let me try it again. Hang on. You see it now? Yeah, we see now. Okay, now, now I'm going to expand my... Now it's working, right? Yeah, now we see full screen mode, yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. All right. So let's get started. The main things are on the slide. Uh, Barb McClintock, um, who I had the great fortune to know um, beginning in 1980. Uh, so I knew her for the last 12 years of her life. Uh, I started with corn transposable elements, maize transposable elements over here. Um, oh, let me see if I can, can you see my pointer when I move it? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Excellent, yeah. good. And then in about 2000 or so, I switched to rice when the rice genome sequence became available. And I'll tell you about the rest of this as we go along. So begin, when I began back in 1980 um, as a postdoc, all we had really was genetics. 
So meaning that we had all the mutant alleles that all of the wonderful geneticists had isolated before us. And so you had the mutant alleles in the spotted kernels in corn, you had the beautiful anthocyanin pigments in petunia, um, and these are all transposable element phenotypes. And what was good about this, and I didn't realize it at the time, is that everything we were looking at here were active transposons, they were moving. And it turns out that's very rare to have an active transposon. So we knew that we were looking and studying an active element. And the second thing is we knew exactly where that element was in the genome. So for example, this is a mutant allele of a, a gene in the anthocyanin pathway. So we knew that sitting in that gene was an active transposable element. So that was the good news. And from studying those mutant alleles, um, McClintock actually determined that transposable elements uh, formed a family. So the family, so for example, she discovered the AC and DS elements. Um, I'm assuming you guys are, are very up on genetics. So um, the AC element she defined as an autonomous element, meaning that um, it encoded um, everything that was needed for it to move itself. Um, in, the, in, the, in the family were also non-autonomous elements. That's what I show here as in some cases, deletion derivatives of autonomous elements. These elements um, genetically, if they inserted into a gene, they made a mutant allele, but they couldn't move the non-autonomous element unless the autonomous element was in the genome. So this would be a family. The family was defined as the autonomous element encoded um, a protein that was responsible for the movement, the transposase, I've shown it here. This transposase um, bound to the ends of the elements of both the autonomous and the non-autonomous elements, okay? And facilitated their movement from one place in the genome to another. Okay, so that's sort of what we learned from the genetics. The, that's sort of the good news. The problem is that when elements cause mutation, they're, they're not good for the plant. So if an, a transposable element moves and inserts into a gene, um, you know, it's, it's not a big deal here that the, the gene is an anthocyanin gene, so you don't get color. But if it inserts something that's useful, you know, the plant could die. So these elements that were isolated turned out to be um, not really important in genome evolution um, because they were mutagens. So just like any mutagen, it was not good for the plant. And so when we started to look at genomes and we started to look at what, what was in genomes, their sequence, these elements were generally low copy number elements. And the reason they're low copy number elements is because if their copy number increases, they make lots of mutations and that's not good for the plant, okay? So these elements had a minimal impact on gene evolution. And McClintock's interest was genome evolution. And so because it was her interest, it became my interest. And so these elements weren't really that interesting to me. So instead, what I went looking for were what are the transposable elements that do in fact have an impact on plant gene and genome evolution. And so to do that, we had to switch from, uh, switch focus to what, what you'll hear about are high copy number transposable elements. Okay, but what was not so, Many of you are familiar with Drosophila. Um, you're familiar with mammalian systems where the high copy number elements in mammalian systems are aloe elements. There's hundreds of thousands of copies of aloe elements. Um, at the time when I started getting involved in this in the mid 90s, we didn't know what the high copy number elements were in plant genes, in plant genomes, okay? And that's the first project that we took on is what are these elements in plants? And the project actually, um, like most projects, you know, it starts in one place and it just ends up someplace else. Um, we, uh, we were looking, and when I say we, it was a postdoc in my lab named Tom Bureau. Um, this, and this is back in 92. So this is when computers were just starting to be used in genetic analysis and in biological research, really. And what happened is people would sequence genes, and that's about all you could do then would be, you'd, you'd have, I had an NIH grant and half the project was sequencing one gene, okay, over 
over three years. Um, so people would sequence their genes, and this is just shows the gene I worked on, which is a really important called the waxy gene, um, exons and introns, and it was a mutant allele of waxy. And Tom Bureau determined that sitting in that, that exon was a small transposon of like, I don't know, about 120 base pairs. Okay, so what he did back then is um, he decided to take this sequence, and this is even before BLAST, he compared this sequence to the other sequences that people had submitted in the database. And what he found, in fact, was that there were a lot of normal plant genes. So people would sequence normal genes, and he would find that there were lots of normal genes that had sequences like this sequence, like sitting in an intron, sitting in a five point. These are all different genes from other plant species. Um, uh, sitting in a five prime flanking sequence, sitting in a three prime flanking sequence. These were normal genes. So as I said before, alu elements are all over human genes, or pri you know, uh, mammalian genes, let's say, or primate genes. Well, these little elements were all over plant genes, normal plant genes. And so he called these elements um, uh, miniature inverted repeat transposable elements. And these are elements that they're similar in structure, but not so much in sequence. And we call them mites for short, okay? So what are mites? If we go back to this family that I've shown you that have autonomous elements, non-autonomous elements, what Tom Bureau and I figured out after a while is that this is a different kind of non-autonomous element. And these non-autonomous elements can attain very high copy numbers. So whereas these non-autonomous elements are deletion derivatives of big elements, there's only a couple of copies in the genome, maybe 20, maybe 30 at most. With these little elements, they can attain hundreds of copies, even sometimes thousands of copies. So as I said before, we were looking for elements that were present in genomes in very high copies, and we found this class of elements. So this isn't any one type of element, but it's, a, it's members of families. Okay, now, what are, where do mites fit in in a plant genome? So plant genomes and grass genomes, maize genome can be huge, absolutely gigantic. So what I'm showing you here is a, just a cartoon of a region of let's say the maize genome, okay? And here are the genes and the genes are sort of sitting in and the maize genome is 85% transposable elements, okay? Um, the vast majority of those elements are retrotransposons. And you literally have genes that are separated from the gene next door by 50 or 100 KB. So you have genes and retrotransposons. Mites, these little elements, so what I've shown here is I've drawn this gene as exons and introns, and mites are the little elements that are in five prime, three prime, and intron regions. And a gene can have several mites in it. And what I've shown here is that there's three different kinds of mites, meaning that they're not related by sequence. Okay, so we have this. Mites are the little elements that sort of, you know, are, are in genes um, and retrotransposons are between genes. Okay, so the problem was that all of these elements that we looked at were just from the computer, okay? We just looked at them and we just studied their sequence, but I wanted elements that moved because I started with, you know, McClintock's elements and they moved. And that's fun to watch, elements that move, it's exciting. So, but there were no mites that were moving around. So we had to find one and we did. So this shows you, if you take a mite sequence, a particular element, and you blast it against like the rice genome, what you get are all of these different copies, let's say a couple of hundred copies, um, and this is an unrooted tree, as you all know. Um, and what it tells you, so what you'll, you'll get a tree like this, indicating that at some time in the past, the element burst, it increased in copy number, and then it stopped amplifying, and then all the copies just drifted, okay? They just, and that's what all of this is. The element amplifies, and then if you look at many other mites in the genome, you'll see that, and this, these trees should be different. They should, each tree should look unique because it's a different bursting element, okay? So this is what we had. This is all we had really with mites were a lot of uh, historic 
record of what they did in the past. So as I said, I, would, I wanted to find an active mite. So what I wanted to do was to identify an element that was in this phase, okay? That was, was increasing its copy number rapidly. It was active, okay? So I'm, what I'm calling this phase is the burst. It's a massive increase in copy number. And up until that time, and in fact, since that time, very few people have identified um, bursting mites, as I'll call them. So I collaborated with a group in, uh, at Washington University, it was Sean Eddy's group when he was at Wash U, and they used the program that he had developed. So this is 2002. The right genome sequence became available in 2001, the whole genome sequence. So I switched from maize to rice. And what we did is we used a program, what Sean Eddy's group did, um, was to use a program called Recon. And what it did is it took the whole rice genome sequence and compared it to itself in order to identify families, families of related sequence. Okay. So what we were looking for, any element that is recently moving around, the copies are going to be identical. As you saw, let's see the middle part here, the copies, it copies and copies and copies, it moves and moves and moves, increases its copy number, and every copy is basically identical. As time goes on, it accumulates mutations, but at these early stages, it's identical. So we identified a sequence that looked like a mite that had 50 nearly identical copies in the genome of Nipomari. Okay. But as many of you know who do computational analysis, anything you get from a computer is a, is a candidate. It's not anything that's real. So, I mean, it's real, but it's, it's not doing necessarily anything interesting. You have to go to the lab and prove that um, it's an active element. And Ning Jiang, who was a graduate student in the lab at the time, she now is a, a full professor at uh, Michigan State and doing a wonderful job. Um, she was able to use cell culture to show that this element, this little element was capable of moving around. Okay, so now we have our mite, it's moving. The problem is it's moving in cell culture, but we lucked out. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit, I'll come back to that in a second. So this little element, MP, okay, um, it is a deletion. So it was isolated from the sequenced Nipomari genome. Fortunately, this genome was sequenced, um, it's the reference genome. It was, it's a beautiful genome. Okay, so now it's easy to get whole genomes. Back then, it, you know, the human genome, I guess the first one cost a couple of billion dollars and now you can get it for a couple of thousand. But same thing with the rice genome. The first genome was sequenced very, very well. It was sequenced with, with bats and yaks and it was contig, beautiful genome. And so what we were able to do is, is blast this little sequence, find the 50 or 60 copies, but also uh, find that there was a single copy in the genome, just one copy of what we now know as the autonomous element. The, uh, this is ping, mping, as we call it, is a perfect deletion derivative of ping, okay? So it has those sequences. Ping encodes the transposase, it encodes two proteins, but don't worry about that, we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about it. Okay, so we have our transposon family with one copy of ping, and about 50 copies of mping in the sequence Nipomari uh, genome. Okay, what we then did, but we got a problem, and that is that 50 copies is not a lot. I said to you that this is an element that it can contain high copy numbers, and 50 is not really a lot. And here's Nipomari, the reference genome. When we started to look at other right strains, um, we found that there were like 25 to 50 copies, which again isn't very exciting. Well. Another group, I won't go into the details, but another group in Japan that became collaborators with us, the lab of uh, Yutaka Okamoto, um, they were looking at actual rice plants in which this element was moving around. And one of the graduate students from that lab brought his seed, uh, brought the rice seed to my lab, and, we, and the element was moving in these strains. And what we found is in these four strains, there are hundreds of copies of the m thing element, okay? So now we have a possibility that we've caught the m thing element in these strains at these early stages where it's bursting, okay? So now the question is, m thing is bursting in these strains, is it still moving around? 
because in order to address the questions we are interested in, that we address, we had to have the element moving around. Okay. So the way we did that experiment to ask, and this is the only way that you can tell if an element is, well, now you do it by sequence, but you have to look from generation to generation to generation and actually see, or, you know, through the sequence or whatever, new insertion. And so what you have here, and I'm not going to go into the technique, but this is a technique called transpose on display. It's like um, ASLP, old ancient technique. And what you're seeing here is 10 different uh, siblings, DNA from 10 siblings. Each of these bands represents um, the end of the element out. It's a PCR-based technique. Um, essentially, what we did is this is the F0 generation. We take this plant and we take 10 seed from this plant and we look at the next generation. We take this plant, we take 10 seed from that. News all self, we look at the next generation. Okay, what we're seeing, so let's look at, here's this new band here, a new insertion. When we look at the siblings, the next, no, sorry, the progeny, the next generation, we see that that band is there and it segregates because when it inserts, it's only inserting into one of the two genomes uh, that are present in the zygote. Um, but as you see that as the generations go on, the number of bands is increasing, okay, by a lot. And what I'm, what I'm not showing you here, this is a technique where you're only seeing about 2% of all the insertions in the genome, okay? So what we can say is that this element is amplifying with about 10 to 40 new insertions per plant per generation. It's just massively inserting, okay? And so essentially the burst is continuing in these four lines. So now we can ask the questions that I have wanted to ask. And what are those questions? So first of all, what I can say is that this is a successful transposon. What do I mean by a successful transposon? So where do transposon families come from? They're created in the genome by mutations, by recombination, by whatever. The genome is the, is the place where these things are born, okay? Most of these elements that are created are, are not successful, okay? They're not good elements, okay? They, they'll maybe make a few copies, they'll be mutagens, and they'll never make more copies, okay? So what I say, most PE families are unsuccessful and have a minimum impact on gene and genome evolution, okay? And the reason is, like I said, they're mutagenic, they may be silent, and the overall effect is they're very low copy number. Okay, we're not interested in those. Okay, successful elements attain high copy numbers because as I said, they possess what I call biochemical features. They have certain features that lead to their success that, that allow them to amplify. Okay, I call these features superpowers, all right? So MP, the ping and ping family has these superpowers. And the question is, what are these superpowers? Okay, so the questions that I'm gonna address as we go on is how does the MPing element burst without killing the host? Why is it not mutagenic? So we're getting all these insertions every generation from generation to generation and the rice plants look pretty good. How long has this burst been going on? Okay, how does the element, this is something that I think your, your groups will be interested in because you're interested in epigenetics. Why isn't it silenced, okay? Why isn't the epigenetic machinery turning this off? Is it because the epigenetic machinery is mutant? Is it because it's, it's avoiding silencing by some way, okay? How like, so 3000 rice strains and even more now have been sequenced. Where else is this burst going on than in these few strains? And then finally, the question I'm gonna spend a lot of time on because it's not, it has, it's the newest stuff and I think it's the most exciting is how does a burst spread to a population and what, how does, does, does it generate structural variation? Does it generate um, copy number variation, inversions? What is it doing on a major scale to the genome besides just inserting in these different sites? Okay, so. This one's an easy one. How does the element attain high copy numbers without killing its host? This is kind of a sort of, really? You know, there was, so we had all these strains with new insertions. 
And so we had, we took 1,600 brand new insertions, like they just happened in, in a, a population of 24 plants. Um, we did it by high throughput sequencing. And this just shows, let me try to do this. So this is a tip, this is a gene. And the question is, where are those new insertions? Okay. The, we have, we've divided into the basically intergenic region, five prime UTR, three prime UTR, exons or introns. These gray bars are the control. It's, it's what we'd expect just from the sequence. So what we see, which was really surprising, is we expected based on the sequence to see a certain percent of the insertions in exons. And we, in fact, we found that there were very few insertions in exons. Now, some of you are gonna think, well, they're mutants. Well, most of these insertions we're looking at are brand new and they're heterozygous. So it's not that these are homozygous lethal, okay? It, there's actually a good reason for this and I'll show you that in a second. So we were very surprised to see that there are very few exon insertions. That would explain why this element, one reason why this element isn't hurting the host because it's avoiding exons. Okay, this, a student in the lab, so there are much fewer exon insertions than we expected by chance, okay. So we did another experiment or Nathan Hancock did an experiment. He took the element, the M-ping element and the ping element and put it into soybean. He made transgenic soybean, okay. And he did the same experiment. He looked at hundreds of insertions in soybean. And what he found there was different. He found that there was an, that what you expected and what you got, what you, what you found were the same. So there was no shortage of exon insertions in soybean. Okay, this was very strange. Because if you look at the insertion sites, and this is just to show you that in soybean and rice, the nine base pairs around where these thousands of insertions went are pretty much the same in rice and soybean. So this turned out to be, why does MPing avoid exon insertions in rice? So as you saw before, the ping transposase actually has a nine base pair target site, which is AT rich. Okay, it's a preference for inserting into AT rich sequence. And you can see that here. These are nine base pairs are pretty AT rich. Okay, it's not it's just a preference, it's not strict. Okay. Rice exons are GC rich. So if you look at the, the average exon intron percentage GC, it's 51% GC exons and 37% GC introns, okay? So soybean exons are much less GC rich, okay? Seems like it's just sort of, really? So what was happening here was actually very, very simple. The, the M-ping elements, the ping M-ping family, was able to amplify successfully, that is without doing too much harm to rice, because there was a unique combination of what I call an interaction between the ping and ping biochemistry, and that is the preference, the AT rich transposase target and the host genome features, okay? And this is something that I never expected to see, that, that you have an element that is so that it is successful because it's able to amplify in its host because it's causing little harm, but it probably wouldn't have been successful in another genome, in another species, okay? Did not expect that. Okay, so we have that. That's actually pretty straightforward. Next is how long has the burst been going on? This is gonna get a little complicated, but it'll probably be the most complicated part of that. So in order to do this, we sequenced two bursting strains. So remember I told you we had four bursting strains. We sequenced, completely sequenced two of them. And those strains are A123, I call it, and A119. These are right successions. The MPing element is bursting in both. Okay, so it's on that histogram I showed before it had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of MPing elements. Okay. And I did this sequence, I didn't do the sequence, but it was done as a project for my undergraduate class. And what we found, which was unbelievable, was that these two genomes were almost identical. They, were, they, only, they, shared, they differed by 450 SNPs, okay? Which is, I mean, the average difference between 
related rice strains, there's about 100,000 SNPs. These two genomes differ by 450 SNPs, okay? They shared 23 MPEGs and they shared one PEG, okay? So we could go back and say their last common ancestor, which we don't have, was back here, okay? And it, it has what was shared, the one PEG and the 23 MPEG. Okay, so this is what the ancestor looked like. So I got in touch with the Japanese group with, who, who had sent us these strains and they went into their basement and where they had their breeding records. And they found that this, these two strains originated from a strain about a hundred years ago, okay? And what we can, what I'll show you here is that if we look at the ping and ping insertions, okay, this one, this strain has nine new ping insertions, the autonomous element, this one has, and 208 new M ping insertions, this one, so they differ by all of these ping and M ping insertions. This one has six new ping insertions and 310 new M ping insertions. So since they diverge from a common ancestor, they've been accumulating their own collection of ping and M ping elements. Okay. So with only 450 SNPs that differ between, besides these ping and ping insertions, we can say, see the thing about rice is it's a selfer. So just from generation to generation, you just self it. There's no outcrossing, there's nothing. So we can say that these lines were maintained as pure lines by self or SIB population for about a hundred years, okay? So this has been going on for a hundred years. The other thing that's really interesting is that there are about 44,000 other transposon insertions in these genomes, okay? All of them are identical. Every single one of them is identical. So we know that a subset of those elements, like 10 families, are still capable of activity, but are epigenetically silenced. So the fact that they are, there's no difference after 100 years in these two, tells us that epigenetic regulation has been maintained for the 100 years. During the entire time that these have been going this lineage to here, self, 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 this lineage to here, ping and mping have been increasing their copy number, but the other elements haven't been moving at all. Epigenetic silencing, epigenetic regulation has been maintained in these strains. Okay. So it says here, the burst has continued for over a century and it's still going on. Okay. So how does it, how do these elements avoid silencing? So that's what's happening. They're silencing in those strains. But this element is, as a friend of mine said, it's going under the radar. Okay. So in order to do that, we looked at the methylation state, as is done in other organisms, of the ping and mping elements in the Nipombari strain and in the high copy strains. And this is a little complicated, but I'll cut to the chase. Essentially, this is mping in the reference genome. So this is where there are 50 copies in this genome. And what you could see is this is a, MPing is 412 nucleotides. You could see that it's highly methylated, okay? Here is MPing in the high copy strain. This strain has about 600 MPing elements. It's also highly methylated. In fact, it's exactly the same, okay? And these are the small RNAs, the small, the, the short um, interfering RNAs. The, in plants, these are the small RNAs that feed back to the genome and lead to methylation, okay? So what we see is that both the low copy strain and the high copy number strain have small interfering RNAs, and these are the reason why all the MT elements are silent, or not silent, they're, they're methylated, okay? So all copies of MT are highly methylated in both these genomes, in all, in all the strains, okay? And the reason for that is that MPing elements are inserted in introns, they're inserted in, five, in transcription units, essentially, and they're inserted in both orientations. So what happens is that when they get transcribed with an intron, for example, you'll get RNAs made from different genes, essentially, where the, you'll get both strands of the, of the MPing uh, transcribed. They'll form double stranded RNA, and in plant genomes, this is the signal. This is what leads to, this binds to Argonaut, 
and then goes back and feeds to the genome and leads to the methylation. So all the MPINGs in the genome, in all genomes that we looked at, are methylated. They're all recognized. Okay, now, why is the system still active? Well, what I told you before is that M the MPING is a deletion derivative ping, okay? But it's a very special deletion derivative, and we didn't realize it. It doesn't have any coding sequence, okay? It, so here is the promoter of ping, which goes into this open reading frame and into this open reading frame, the two proteins. But ping doesn't have any of those sequences, okay? So what I'm gonna show, this is, I'll make this as simple as possible. These are the ends of ping elements. There are like seven ping elements in the high copy number strain. Here's mping down here. It's, and this is mping up to 250. So this is, we're looking at this end of, of mping, okay? Which is also this end of ping. And what you see is that the, the small RNAs that lead to the methylation of, of these mpings also lead to the methylation of ping, all the ping copies, but not into the promoter region, okay? So it doesn't, the methylation, the recognition of mping does nothing to silence the production of proteins from the autonomous element. So it says here, small RNAs generated from mping elements inserted around the genome lead to the methylation of only non-coding sequences shared with ping. Okay. So host recognition of mping doesn't matter. Ping remains active. Mping keeps increasing in copy number. So this is why the system stays active because it's mping that is using the transposase and moving and the host already recognizes mping. It's not recognizing ping. For ping to be silenced, it's going to have to move someplace where it'll generate, where um, small RNAs will be generated against it. And so far that hasn't happened. Okay, I'm sure there's a lot of I questions. I have a question here. here. May yeah, I interrupt? go ahead. So then, oh, is there hang on a second. I just, user... One second, I just, hang on. I just spilled my water glass all over my keyboard. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. Go ahead, ask a question. No problem. Hang on, let me just go get myself a towel. <laughs> The joys of being at home. Hang on. <sighs> okay, I'm back. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was wondering then, what is the use of this methylation? Uh, is it just to keep the uh, mping inactive? inactivated and uh, because the pink uh, repeats are also getting methylated. So what is the consequence well, of only this? The, only the sequence that's related to mping gets methylated. So let me go back and do that. So it doesn't, it, there is no, the fact that mping is, um, let me go back to that. Okay, let's do this. Okay, hang on, I'm soaking wet here, hang on. So the only sequences in ping that get methylated are at the end of the element, yeah. okay? So, so mping gets methylated and there's no meaning to it. It gets methylated because small RNAs are made. If M mping has no activity. I mean, it can move and it, it can move when it's methylated. It has no problem moving because all the mpings in the genome are methylated, yet the element keeps moving. And it's moving because transposase can still bind to it and pick it up and move it somewhere and copy it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the reason mping methylation means nothing at all, biologically. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it means nothing. Thank you. Right. Thank you. It's tricking the, the, the organism in a sense. It's, the organism is wasting its energy basically mm -hmm. methylating yeah. it because it doesn't really matter yeah i guess i don't know all right so that's about as difficult as we're going to get here it'll get easier after this okay so now the question we're going to address is how widespread is this burst so we found it in these few strains and this is really easy um essentially we we looked we meaning uh uh Jin Feng chen 
was a postdoc in the lab and did some great work. Um, he took, the, again, rice is wonderful because it's so important to the world. So there's a lot of resources that are available for genomic analysis. One of them is uh, the 3000 Genome Project. Um, and what Jin Feng did was simply to look and see uh, uh, ping and mping copy numbers in these 3000 strains. And here are the phylogenetic relationship of the 3000 strains, doesn't matter. This is mping copy number. Okay, so there's mping present in virtually all of these strains. Okay, this is ping copy number. Out of 3,000 strains, only about 400 of the strains have ping. But the important part is the high copy number in ping is only present in a few strains. Okay, so only in the strains that we have, and really that's about it. We've never found another strain, and we haven't looked very hard, but all the other strains have, what, 25 to 50 copies of mping. So what it says here, the mping ping burst is very recent and is probably restricted to a few very closely related accessions or strains. So this is a recent burst, very, very recent. You could think of it with P elements, almost like, you know, with your sophomore, like P elements. I mean, there's something that in, in my lifetime has spread throughout the world throughout the Melanogaster and now, I forgot what the other Drosophila species that where the P elements are now spreading. But there are very, very, very few examples of, of transposon bursts um, that have been published thus far. I think with the ability now to sequence genomes so easily, we're gonna see that there are a lot more species out there um, where transposons are actively moving around like this. Not many, but okay. The last question that I'm gonna address here, any other questions before I get into this part? Okay, with the last bit of water I have left. We wanted to look at phenotypes. Everybody wants to know about phenotypes, okay? And so what you do is you uh, generate a recombinant in breadline population. Okay, that's what genetics do. And this is what uh, Yutaka Okamura lab did. He took the reference genome, and he crossed it with uh, one of the high copy number strains called HEG4. So this has over 500 mpings. And so you get an F1, and then you go through 10 generations of selfing, and you get hundreds of real lines or common and inbred lines, okay? And the question is, how do they differ phenotypically? So what, what are the mping elements doing phenotypically? And essentially, um, so we sequenced all of these lines using Illumina short read sequencing. Um, we're phenotyping it, but there's really nothing significant. We don't see really anything significant in terms of phenotypic differences. Now, admitted, we're not looking at, you know, subtle things like hormone usage and weight and things like that. For obvious things, these plants look pretty healthy. They're still pretty healthy. And I think this is part of an element being so successful is that it, it does little harm. Okay, now, so rills are being analyzed in depth to further understand the burst and how, now, we wanna know what else is going on. What else is mping doing to the genome? And this is the part that, um, you know, we're, we're, this is the part I'm most excited about. Um, Cause it gets into issues of, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, I'm gonna, diver, I'm gonna go off field here and then come back. So does higher mping copy numbers destabilize the genome? And if so, how? Um, okay. So first of all, if you look at the whole population, the 272, there are 14,000 new mping insertions. There's only about 17 new ping insertions. Okay. So that doesn't matter. Okay. So any real that has a ping, of an autonomous element of source of transposase has new mping insertions, which means that, um, the element is spreading through this population with no silencing. So there still continues to be, because the element still keeps moving around. Nobody is silent, okay? So this isn't really that important. What we wanted to do is look for structural variation in this population, and I'll explain to you why. And this will we'll get away from this for a second and get into some real genetics and biology. So what are such structural variation and why are they of increasing interest in plant and animal genomics? Okay. 
So structural variation, and this is a department that knows a lot about genetics, um, are um, of various types. There's copy number variation. So you have one genome which has a particular array of genes. You have another genome that has duplicates of other genes where regions have been copied. There's the other things called presence absence variation. Okay, you have some genes that are missing in some strains. And I'm not talking about mutant strains, I'm talking about normal strains. Okay, we have inversions that are going on. So this is summarized here. This is a whole new uh, field of pan genomes. Okay, so paired genomes, now that we can easily sequence genomes from a species, um, whole genomes, and we can sequence them perfectly We're using PacBio or you know, nanopore technology cheaply, we find out that a species doesn't contain the same genes. That if you look at different individuals, different populations, you'll find that they share a certain set of genes called the core genome. And they, there's another set of genes, which are the dispensable genome. These are genes that are present in some populations and not in others. These could be genes that allow the organism to adapt to the environment, for example. In plants, they could be disease resistance genes. Um, so as I said, you have the core genome that is present in all members of the species. Um, and then you have these dispensable genes that are only shared by some individuals. And the whole, all of these um, populations is called the pan genome, essentially, okay? So, the analysis of pan genomes, as I said before, is now possible because we can easily sequence. We don't have just one more reference genome. And it says, you know, what we found out is one reference is not enough. Even with humans, I mean, it's being found that, you know, that uh, humans from Africa have, you know, 900 genes that are not in uh, the, the original reference genome that came out in 2002. Okay. So, this is, uh, to give you an idea, this is about a year or two out of date, but this is to give you an idea of the size of the core and the dispensable genome in a few plant species. So, and this is, these numbers, like I said, are much larger than this now. This, as I said, the slide is out of date. Arabidopsis, for 19 genomes that have been sequenced, the pan genome has about 38,000 genes. 70% are core and 30% are dispensable, okay? And we can look over a variety of things. Um, uh, Brachiopodium has about the same, 37,000, 54% core, 46% dispensable, on and on. Um, and you know, you, this keeps changing. The more genomes you sequence, the more dispensable genes that you find um, until you reach a point where you've sort of sequenced, you've saturated it, okay. So, why do we care about this? Okay, so this is, this is becoming a focus of, of, of all areas of, of genome analysis, whether it be plants or animals. And it says here, structural variation, what these, these genomes differ by these structural variations. They can cause major phenotypic variation, um, affecting a series of important agronomic and quality traits. Characterization of these SVs, is becoming the frontier of plant genomics. Okay, so why do populations have different genes and what does it matter? Okay, it's not just in plants, this is in, um, in, in fungal species. And in fungal species, it really goes to the extreme because you have these mini chromosomes. So this is an example where in fungal phytopathogens, what you have are you have a chromosome where it's mostly annotated genes, and then you have these dispensable chromosomes or where there's a, this is where it comes into the transposons. The dispensable genes are usually um, associated with transposable elements. Okay. So what you have here is this chromosome, which in, in fungal species, which have tons of transposons, um, and you, so essentially you have the transposons speed evolution. They cause genes to be gained and lost, we think. I mean, the problem is nobody has ever seen them gained or lost. You just look and see this correlation between the 
the fast evolving genome and the presence of transposable elements in the core genome and in four fewer transposable elements. Okay, so this is the same thing that's happened seen in uh, plant species. That is that transposon density surrounding the core and variable genes was investigated in, in this case, Brassica. Okay, so what was found is that there's a higher transposon density surrounding the variable genes compared to the core genes. Okay, so somehow people are thinking transposable elements are involved in shuffling the genomes in this way. Okay. So how do transposable elements actually generate structural variation? This hasn't been seen. So there's a correlation, it's sort of a guilt by association. But Barbara McClintock, in fact, Barbara McClintock showed us how this happens. So for anything that's, that's, that's new and exciting, it's always helped, at least for, you know, for me to go back and, and look at Barbara McClintock. And in fact, the first transposable element that she isolated, the DS element, dissociation, we were just talking about this um, before the seminar, um, caused chromosomes to break. So what you have here is chromosome nine. So you have here a, a corn kernel, right? And the purple part is purple because it has this chromosome, okay? And this chromosome has a color gene on it that's wild type. Now on that same chromosome is this site. So what, what happens in this region is that the chromosome has broken and it's lost the end of it and revealed all of these genes on the other chromosome. And so what happens is this is how she discovered transposons. It was a site of not transposition, but breakage. The chromosome was breaking at this DS element. You were losing the end of it, but she found out something else. And that is that this chromosome did not break unless there was something else in the genome. And that something else was an autonomous element. We now know it's the AC element. So if this element, this AC was, was not present, you'd have a purple kernel and this chromosome would be stable, no breakage. When you cross AC into the strain, you start getting these big breakage, okay? That's how she discovered ACDS. And then she found that DS could then move around. Okay, so it goes back to my history. I had a postdoc in my lab who um, now is at Purdue, um, named Cliff Weil, one of my favorite people in the world. And he wanted to know what's happening when a chromosome breaks. What, what, what is this DS that's breaking? So what he did was he essentially found out that when, a, when you have a breaking DS, it's actually two DS elements that are near each other, okay? So these, he did PCR, and this was PCR back in 1993, and he was able to show that the breaking chromosome was an aberrant transposition. So you essentially get the transposon, so it's complicated. All I could say is that when you have two DS elements that are near each other, okay, you can get transposase to bind to one end and transposase to the other, you know, and you end up getting a break in the chromosome, okay? It's abnormal transposition. So now, the reason you get this often with DS is DS moves locally. So the DS element, like many transposons, usually move within two to four map units. So it moves from one site and it moves over a couple of map units. So you frequently get DSs that are tightly linked to each other. And these linked elements cause breakage. Okay, so I have your DS like many other transposons transposed to nearby linked sites where they cause deleterious mutations. They're deleterious because there are these major structural changes, they break. DS elements, and this is why DS elements are mutagen, it's one of the reasons. Um, they can't burst and attain high copy number because when they move, they usually move nearby. Okay. Now, our MPing element, it turns out, doesn't do that. So this is a transgenic Arabidopsis. We took a tDNA with an MPing and a ping element on it, and we inserted it. This is um, Wu Jin Yang, when he was a postdoc in my lab a while back. He inserted it one site over here, 
And then we let it grow for a couple of, I don't know, generations. And we found that there were MP elements all over the genome, okay? So MP does not move from one site to a nearby site. It goes all over the site, okay? I don't know about that so far. So this is, as it is, one of the superpowers that allows this element to attain high copy numbers and be successful. Because if it moves locally, it'll cause breaks more frequently. This moves all over the place, so it doesn't break that much. In fact, it, it hardly breaks at all until, okay. Now, but as the burst continues and MPing copy number increases, there should be more MPing elements that insert near each other, okay? Because if you have hundreds and hundreds of elements going all over the place, you have a much higher chance that one element will end up near another element. Okay, and the higher the copy number, the more chance that you're going to have linked elements. So let's go back to the real population. All right, so let's look and see what did we find when we looked at the sequences of all of these guys? Did we find any structural variations? And the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about this. Okay, so, but we use short reads. When you use short reads, you can't see the vast majority of structural variation. Okay. But this will give you a few examples of what we did see. So this is the, re this is the low copy reference genome. This is one of the parents, Nipomari. The other parent had, in this case, at this locus, two ping insertion, in ping insertion, okay? And it happened to flank this gene, okay? So in the high copy strain, so this, these are two m pings that are 8 KB apart, all right? When we look at the sequences of all the rills, we find one rill where, this whole region has been deleted, okay? So we've had this just this whole, essentially it's been like a mega transposon. So we get a cut from the transposase over here and another cut over here, and we end up with this sequence that's present in this reel. All right, we see a lot of that. We see another case where we have two genes in the reference genome. And in the high copy strain, we have these two pings, M pings that are 2.3 and 2 KB apart, okay? So here's what they look like in the high copy strain, here and here, okay? In the real, we see the same thing. We get removal of all of this sequence. So it's essentially removed a big chunk of the coding of the regulatory region of this particular gene, okay? So we get that. One more example. In this case, we have, here's the, reference genome, we have the high copy strain has this ping and this ping, okay? And it happens to be uh, the first exon um, and part of the intron and upstream region. And in the high copy strain, this is what it looks like. And in one of the reels, we see that the element, the, the, the two elements have been involved in a, in a structural variation and deletion. Okay, so if we look at, all of the 270 strains, we, we look at all the structural variation, okay, that are deletions, okay? I have to point that out. We are limited because we're using Illumina reads. So we cannot look at inversions, we cannot look at duplications, but we can look at big deletions. And these are all the deletions that we, that Gen Feng has found. What we can say is that most of them, more than half, or have an MPing at one or both ends, okay? These are ones that have nothing to do with it because you expect that you'll get structural variation, but the majority of variation that we see, this type of variation um, is actually due to the transposase. Okay, so what I wanna summarize here is we could only see presence absence variation because the reals were sequenced using short reads. So we can only see when a deletion brings together two things and you get it in a 300 base pair read. So we're actually missing about 80% of the structural variation based on studies people have done with the human genome and looking at what you see with short reads versus what you see with long reads. Long read sequencing um, to detect SVs, including inversions is, is going on now. So we're doing, we're redoing all this using nanopore sequencing uh, to look for the other types. But we know that MPing can cause um, inversions. And we have one, these are two of the strains, the high copy strains 
and we've sequenced the whole thing. We've sequenced them with long read pack bio. And we find that yes, indeed, um, that we have an inversion of 135 KB that has MPINGs at both ends where it's flipped around. So in these high copy number strains, MPINGs have caused this inversion of this large region. Okay, let's get back to this here. The future analysis fell wrong. Um, what we have are two more real populations with much higher copy numbers of ping and MP. We have instead of Nippon, so here are the two parents. And instead of crossing the reference with a high copy, what Utaka did is cross two high copy strains. So the reals are gonna have just more and more and more MPINGs, more and more chance of having linked elements, hopefully more and more chances of having more structural variations. Okay. So all 250 real will be sequenced using long read technology to identify all the SVs, including presence absence variation, copy number variation, and inversion. So to summarize, how does MP burst without killing its host? Genic insert, it has a genic insertion preference. I didn't say that, but it avoids GC rich exons. Okay. How long is the burst persisted? At least for in one case, at least a hundred years, but we you know, but um, how does it avoid silencing? Host recognition of MPing does not lead to ping silencing. So what I say here is my superpower is that it does not contain coding sequences. If it had coding sequences, it would silence the transposase. So it's part of the reason of the success of the mite. And how widespread is the burst? It's, we've only seen it in a few strains, okay? Um, can the burst generate structural variation? Obviously, yes, including presence, absence, variation, and inversion. Now, so structural variation contributes, as I said before, to the diversity of genomes that represent the pan genome. It's most of what they see are structural variations. As I said before, transposable elements often correlate with these structural variations. There's a lot of them in the um, dispensable or the variable parts of the genome. Our data suggests that the ping and ping burst generates structural variations rapidly and at a high frequency and by the following mechanism. And this is really easy. Essentially, structural variations are generated during the burst when transposase is around to catalyze two things, the high copy numbers needed to distribute, to, to increase the frequency of linked elements. So the more transposition you have, the more copies you have, the greater the chance you're gonna have these linked elements. And finally, you have transposase around that cuts the MPing ends. And as those of you working with Drosophila and other systems know, cuts in DNA dramatically increase the frequency of recombination, leading to, in this case, to copy number variants, um, presence absence variations and inversions. So transposable elements shake up otherwise conservative genomes in ways that we are just beginning to understand. Ta -da. So I can thank uh, the folks I've mentioned, most of them. Um, Jason Seach is, a, is an incredible uh, bioinformatics, uh, biopearl author. Um, Anna McClung takes care of our rice plants. We've been funded by NSF, USDA, HHI. And I will stop there. I'm exhausted. It's, it's early for you, but it's late for me, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk. It was uh, a real pleasure to, to listen so much. Uh, Too much, probably, but, no, <laughs> but I'm it's, happy it's to amazing. answer any of your questions. Yeah. So questions, please. So I, I have a few questions. So I, I just wonder that uh, you very nicely explained that uh, the structural variations are basically in pan genome, not, on in, not in core genome. So is there any difference between, for example, Nippon Bari and other accessions that the GC content in the pan genome? Um, so in rice, I mean, the, the arises to Taiva, so that species, has yes. the high GC, um, as does Rufi Pogon, Arisa Rufi Pogon, which is a wild progenitor. Outside of that, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. No, no I, I am particularly curious about, for example, you have two accessions, so for example, in Nippon Bare and the other one. So, and one, one has a, a, a bus, uh, and uh, transpose an element burst and one is protected kind of immunity. So is there any difference? No, no, nobody, nobody's protected. Nobody's okay. protected. It's, I, these are selfing plants. So if you cross, as you saw, the Nippon Bare doesn't have a burst going on. But when you cross it, all the progeny have a burst going on. Okay. There's no protection. There's no immunity here. If the elements get into a stream by crossing, they will burst. Okay. Just like okay. the P elements. There was no protection for the P elements when they started to spread around the world um, until the, um, what is it, pi RNAs started to protect the individuals. But see, rice is a sulfur. I mean, these, these strains are sulfur. So they, unlike Drosophila, which are outcrossers, um, these are sulfur. So if these strains were crossed with a lot of other strains, I think it could be really detrimental to domesticated rice, it could possibly be. There's nothing that's, there's no protection. It's sort of like COVID before the vaccine. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, one, sure. one, one other yeah. question, yeah. So uh, basically, so is there any possible, for example, you, uh, uh, we, we see that, for example, some uh, uh, deletions or, uh, caused by these uh, elements? Is there any way that we can utilize this for directional de deletions? So anyone working on this? You know, it's probably easier to do CRISPR. Because okay. you can't, you know, you, you can direct things there. This you can't, it does what it, it's a natural system and it's doing what it wants to do. Um, I think with CRISPR around, it's, it, you know, we used to use transposons a lot for mutagenesis and you know, all the populations we had. And, but with CRISPR now, it just doesn't make any sense. It's, you know, it's such a wonderful tool to do precisely what you want to do. Yeah, yeah but the CRISPR doesn't allow, I mean, la large deletions, for example, if you want to uh, delete uh, 5 KB or 10 KB. Right. Uh, you know, and we, could, we could possibly, you know, engineer, you could put the end things where you want to put them. I haven't thought about that because I, I think more about you know, basic stuff, how does it work rather than, you know, how do I, how do I use it? So maybe, you know, somebody else will, will figure that out. Right. No, but you're right. I mean, CRISPR does very particular things. Right. And, and one other, I, I think I am curious about, for example, when you are comparing about the uh, intron and exons, so the genes, for example, around 20% of rice genome is intronless. So is there a, any difference between the genes which are intron less, so they, they have less frequency of these insertions compared to the genes which have introns? I mean, I, I would think that the genes that have no introns yeah. would not have transposon insertions. Okay, okay. Yeah, I bet yeah. they wouldn't have transposon insertions because they'd be mutations then and they'd be selected again. Okay. Thank right, you. sure. Other Anybody questions? Have, sir, I have a question. Yeah, sure. please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wessler. So uh, my question is the, uh, about the graph that you showed um, in the first half of the talk, where uh, you mentioned that uh, very less number of exons are being incorporated with these transposable elements. So um, I have two questions. One is, what is holding back the insertion of transposable elements? What is uh, like the inhibiting factor or the element which is not letting TE insertion into the exons? And my second question is that um, uh, with the graph, it seems like most of the insertions are in the five prime or three prime UTRs and also in the introns, but I ask about the UTRs because uh, with this transposable element insertions, this seems that the three prime and five prime UTR structure is getting disrupted. And this may lead to the lethality of the gene itself because they are also playing regulatory functions of the trans transcripts. So how come that the, the organism is not uh, 
being killed with the TE insertions into the UTR regions. Okay, so your first question about why, why are they not going into exons or why are they going into exons at a much lower frequency? And that has to do with the, the, um, the target sequence specificity of the transposase. So the transposase, before an element inserts, it binds uh, to a sequence. Not a, not, a, not a particular sequence, but something, and in the case for the, for the King transposase, it prefers to go into a nine base pair AT rich sequence. So that sequence would be more rare in an exon because the exons are GC rich. So it's just as simple as that. So we're not saying, and that's why when we look in soybean, which has its exons have much less lower percentage GC, there are many more exon insertions. They're what you expect exon insertions in soybean. So it's, it's not a matter, it's just a matter of the, of the amount of, of um, AT sequence that's present. Your other question, we find that the MPing element prefers to go into um, open chromatin. And open chromatin is generally in the five prime regulatory region. But in plants, in, in maize and in rice, you find in the, you know, first of all, plants have a lot of distal regulatory sequences. So you could be, you know, 10 KB away from the five prime end and you'll have a cis regulatory sequence. So all of that sequence in the middle, the transposon can insert into and have no impact on gene expression, on regulation. So that's in fact, you know, that's how plant genes are, are organized. Maize, it's even worse because the maize genome is, is huge and maize genes, um, you, there are some genes that's for, it's, it's like some genes in Drosophila where you have regulatory regions that are, that are 10, 20, 30 KB, but in plants, it's, it's more common. It's not just like the regulatory genes, the, uh, um, whatever, the developmental genes. In, in plants, it's not in Arabidopsis so much, but Arabidopsis is not a typical plant. It has a small genome. Um, it's a model plant, but you know, the, so Plant genomes have, plant genes have much larger five prime regulatory sequences and more distal um, regulatory, you know, cis regulatory regions. So there's more space that elements can insert and have virtually no impact on gene expression. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question. Um, sure. Uh, sorry for that, but. No problem. Uh, so uh, nature um, is obviously, um, helping the uh, initially at the first place, how at the first place the transposable elements um, can overrule the silencing because, uh, because I believe at the first place they are silent, kept in the genome, silently kept in the genome, but then somehow um, something, so I, I don't know much about this field, but I, I think that uh, the silencing effect goes away and then they move around randomly in the genome. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Silencing is in control and something comes in that isn't recognized. So normally silencing, you know, when silencing doesn't work, I mean, you know, it's bad. I mean, you have lots of things that, that happen and the, the organism, so, so most, organisms have very good epigenetic mechanisms because if they didn't, so it's the elements that come in that move are the exception. So, and it, it takes, they have to do something like for the P element, um, you know, they, they invade a, a population and they insert all over the genome until they, they insert into these pi, pi regions, these pi loci. And, and then, the, then they're under control. You know, then the, the organism shuts them down. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. So I have a question uh, regarding this genome evolution. Very interesting uh, uh, suggestion. You, you, so would you propose that um, when these transposons move and cause the structural variation 
like you also gave the example of maze chromosome and the work from Barbara McClintock. So would you propose that there is some inherent mechanism in the plant which over centuries is working and that mechanism or system actually knows which regions are to be removed or to be lost over you know, the, the time of evolution? And, and what would be the nature of that mechanism or phenomenon? Which is- See, I, don't, I, don't think the, I don't think the plant knows anything. Everything is, is by chance. Everything uh, evolves. When something evolves, it's because it, it survived. So, you know, what, what's happened over time, I think, well, I mean, MPEG elements go all over the place. They're not selecting where they're going. They go all over the place. So if you have a population of thousands and thousands of plants, you know, you could have regions that can delete, that contain core genes, and that, that plant will die, okay? Yeah. But you have other regions that where the elements go and they cause variation, and these are dispensable genes. Well, that plant will live, you know, and, and so that it's just a matter of survival. Mm -hmm. That's all. Got it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Plant doesn't know anything. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there's, yeah, I mean, there's a brain there, but it, it's helping it survive from one generation to the next. Not, yeah. there's not some, I don't think there's some big plan there. It's just uh, what survives and what doesn't. And, uh, like I said, I think the movement of these elements is, is there, there are things that allow this element to increase its copy number, as I talked about. Um, and, and that's just, it's biochemistry. It just lucked out. Um, it was successful. It could, and the fact that it can attain high copy numbers means that it, its copies can go all over the genome. And so it can have double elements all over the place. Um, causing all these different pan genomes. Many of them will die. Some will live um, and contribute to the population in some way. So it, it means the ones which uh, get insertions in some essential genes, they will simply die. And, and the ones which don't, they, they survive. So I was wondering about the four strains where which you, you I think you got from Japan and they showed high hundreds, hundred copy numbers, uh, copies. And then mm -hmm. uh, the strains you had in the lab, they had low copies. Right. So what, I mean, how do you see the biochemistry? What is that biochemical phenomenon? Were they it's in what, advanced stage of evolution? The ones where we had hundred copies. So how do you draw the line? It's a, it's a part I didn't tell you about. So. The strains that have lots of, the strains that are bursting have many pings. So they have many autonomous elements, many sources of transposase. But most rice strains have either zero or one ping. Uh -huh. and, and what I didn't go into is how a strain bursts. So how do you go from one ping to two, to three, to four, to five? Some of these strains have 10 pings. So they have tons of transposase and they are moving like crazy. I didn't go into that. It's a little, it's complicated and we don't understand it completely. Yeah. But it's a pure accident. If there's a, there's a ping that is a little bit more active that's in all these high copy strains. And it just, you know, a ping element, all the pings are identical. This one ping element went into this region in the genome where it became more active. And that's what started the burst. We don't know why it became more active. We haven't been able to figure that out. It's just an accident. All of these things are just accidents. They just we, happen. So can, can, can we suggest that, you know, the uh, extreme stress or physiological stress is something which induces uh, such events of transpositions? Because there may be some, you know, uh, aberrant events uh, at the epigenetic level, loss of methylation or whatever, the non-coding RNA is being lost. Right. And that may induce the initial bursting and that then amplifies due to stress. I mean, and that's seen in some systems, but I, it's not, 
you know, this stress induction, is, it happens a lot for retrotransposons. It doesn't happen a lot for DNA transposons. I mean, McClintock was able to isolate her active elements through mutagenesis. So if you hit a mutagen, so, so yes, in some cases you can activate the silenced elements that are in the genome by stress, okay? But other times what you're doing is the stress is actually selecting the diverse genomes that have active transposon systems. Okay. That's another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we know very little about this because there are very few, very active systems out there. So many of the questions that you're asking, we know very, it's, it's not like viruses. I mean, we, they, they do so many things, but we know so little about them. Now, in the years to come, we're going to learn a lot more now that we can do sequencing so easily. Yeah. So these gaps will become filled. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope, uh, so if there are no more questions, uh, Abdullah, so I think it's really getting late there and we would like to thank you. Uh, it was a real pleasure and everybody really enjoyed the talk. Uh, and uh, I think we would bug you more than often. Uh, That's okay, no problem. I don't mind. You know, this is, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't have to fly to Pakistan. I mean, this is easy, right? For, Although I've never been us, there. So, uh, I call this blessings of blessings of COVID that we are able to listen to, you know, highly accomplished scientists and people. We've had some uh, really good speakers. I've I've seen the list. Really, really good. Yeah. yeah. So Otherwise, I'm, I'm honored I, I think, too. <laughs> Otherwise, it was impossible for us to bring you to Pakistan, you know, <laughs> with all the limitations we have. Uh, thank you I very know. much. We wish you a My good night. There. Thank you all and have a good day. I'm going to thank you get very to much. sleep now. Right. Thank Take you. care Bye -bye. and thanks for the invitation, Abdullah. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.